So for those of you who haven't read my bio, um, I've been an attorney now for about 30 years, and 20 years of that I've spent working with nonprofits. My latest uh, position with a nonprofit, I was the general counsel and deputy director of the California Space Authority, a statewide nonprofit organization that was focused on aerospace issues. So you might wonder, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> so let me explain briefly. I have a plumber and his name is Frank. And Frank uh, installed a reverse osmosis uh, device underneath my kitchen sink. And one year when Frank was there to check on my reverse osmosis, giving it its annual checkup, he said he was writing a book. And in California, that's pretty commonplace. It's like, that's nice, isn't everybody? But he really surprised me a year later when he came back to check on the device and he said he'd finished his book and that it was published. So that was a significant achievement. And I said, just to be nice to Frank the plumber, hey Frank, I'd be happy to buy a copy. Do you have any with you? Oh yes, I have some out in the truck. So I, and he warned me though, he said this is a difficult book to read. And I thought, I'm a good reader. Somehow I graduated from law school, I think I could read a book. And I had a free weekend coming up. So I bought Frank's book, and it's with me today. And Frank's book, as far as I know, is the only first-hand account of registered sex offender and what he has, what has occurred in his life. It's a very compelling book. The, his uh, co-author who edited the book with him, a young woman, was murdered right before this book was published. And the sobering thing is probably by a sex offender. Um, she is very uh, peace oriented and was making a nationwide tour of things that she believed in, including peace gardens and doing something called the really, really free market. And so a foundation has been set up in her name by Frank. And then after Kirsten's um, death, Frank was attacked in his own home. And he was attacked in his own home by somebody who found his name and his home address on the registry. He'd never met Frank. And he broke into Frank's house, and he was waiting for him when Frank entered his house. And the young man had a hammer and meant to kill Frank. In fact, it was a second break in that day to a sex offender, somebody on the list. The first sex offender registered person was a big guy and the, the person who was attacking him was not so big so he left. Frank is a little guy and so he thought he had his target and he took that hammer and he hit Frank and he hit Frank and he tried to kill Frank and Frank's defense that day was a one gallon water jug in his hand that he had gone out to purchase. And so when he came home, he had that water jug in his hand, and that's how he prevented his attacker from killing him. This is a young man who had never met Frank. All he knew was he was angry. He himself had been sexually attacked as a young man, and he wanted to take it out on somebody. And unfortunately that day, it was Frank. Now that young man's name is David, and David's been convicted of uh, his crime and he will serve 13 years and four months in prison for doing what he did and Frank has become David's friend and his advocate because Frank understands that David was himself a victim and he Frank knows he's a victim and he's reached out to help him through his mother to make sure that David gets the best mental and physical care he can while he's in prison. It's gonna, he's gonna be there a long time. And hopefully he will be a whole human being when he comes out. So it is because of Frank, my plumber, that I am here today. And I couldn't be more surprised by my desire to be involved in this cause. I'm a mother of two daughters and I'm a woman. And you think about it and it's not logical, but the fact is that this touches me very deeply as a human being and as an attorney. And I know one reason I went to law school was to defend those who cannot defend themselves. 
and RSOs definitely fit in that category. I had no idea until I read Frank's book how our society is treating registered persons, and it's a damn shame. And as Paul said last night, common sense is not with us in our society, and I think the more people we wake up, the better that we will be as a society. So having said that and given that introduction, I would like to talk and share with you my experiences with lobbying. And the fact is, I was one of those congressional staffers or a staffer to a legislator, um, actually to a committee, um, that the uh, state representative was talking about earlier. And I have to tell you, I was a little concerned when he started talking because I thought, oh my gosh, what if he says something so different than what I'm prepared to tell you about? But the fact is, he makes a great straight man. So you heard it from somebody that sits in the member's, um, in the member's chair, but I can tell you what it is like being a staffer, and then the fact is I've lobbied both elected officials and staffers for 20 years, and I want to share that experience with you. And what I'm going to tell you about today, it's focused on federal. I've done some lobbying on the state level, but quite frankly, our organization had a state lobbyist as well. So, but I think that they're easily translatable no matter where you are when you're talking to any elected official. It could be the mayor, it could be your county supervisor, it could be any elected official. This is a very good way to approach that person so you'll have a better understanding of their shoes and again the state representative gave you some idea of that today and I'd like to give you some more details so next please you might ask yourself why would I want to bother to go to Washington DC and why would I want to talk to those folks anyway after all they, they too seem to have lost their common sense lately so there's really two basic reasons one is if you have a policy issue, and the other one is if you have a funding issue. I have raised over $100 million for aerospace over a 20-year period, and this organization needs resources. I wouldn't count on getting any money from the federal government anytime soon. I think we need policy help first, but someday, we will be celebrating popping a bottle of champagne or sparkling cider just to say that the federal government actually paid one dollar to this cause for all the harm they've done. And before I get onto that soapbox completely, I want to give you an idea, I want to plant a seed with you, and that is this. I believe that the government, the federal government and the state governments are creating a tort every single day that anybody is publishing a registry. And that tort is called the intentional infliction of emotional distress. So please write it down if you have a piece of paper. The intentional infliction of emotional distress. People, anybody who's on the registry, just like Frank, you do not know if you are going to become a victim of violence and somebody's going to break into your home, the sanctity of your home, and commit violence upon you. And Frank, it's already happened to him once. Now he's written a book. And the book is on the table, wherever the book table is. And I encourage you to read it. And you will know what it is like, if you don't already know what it's like, to be in fear for your life. Now that Frank has put this book out, and someday it's going to hit the talk shows or whatever, and he's going to become a well-known registered person, and he is willing to do that. And I know there are other people here too. And as somebody said, I guess it was just last night, you know, the miracle that we're all here, we're wearing name tags, and we're not afraid to say that we're here and standing up for this cause. So I'll get off that soapbox for a moment. Okay, so let's talk about Congress. There are different things that Congress does. One of the things is authorization legislation, and the other is appropriation legislation. So the state representative said he basically is chairman of a committee that deals with veterans matters. Now, from what he said, I didn't know if he was an authorizer or an appropriator, but it's really important to know the difference because the authorizers, again, are setting policy, and for now, I think we really need to talk to authorizers, though sometimes appropriators will borrow language and put it in their bill that also causes problems. So 
again, when you get ready to talk to a member of Congress, you need to know which side they're on. And oh, by the way, then the Appropriations Committee is broken down to all these different subcommittees. And so if you want to go talk to somebody about funding in the Department of Defense, you are wasting your time going to talk to somebody who appropriates funding for the Veterans Administration, believe it or not. So you need to know who funds what. But again, I think our primary focus right now is authorization. So you want to talk to somebody who's policy oriented. And every member of Congress has committee assignments. And it's very important that you know what their committee assignments are because that's how they can help you. They may be totally behind you and not be able to do a darn thing about it. Okay, so it's good to have their support and they do make friends and sometimes they do ask other members for a favor. But for them to be on the inside, being able to help you the best, it's most important that they have the right committee assignment. So next please. So this I came up with this uh, slide which I call the trifecta. Okay, and, and the, the state representative mentioned these things in passing, but he didn't tell you the winning formula. So here we go. Bring a constituent to your meeting. A constituent is somebody who can vote for or against that person. They will pay attention whether or not, uh, you know, if you have somebody from their district who votes. I didn't put anything here about uh, making political contributions, and he did make reference to that. I'm just going to assume that we're not doing that. We're not making political uh, contributions, because the other thing is, unless you make a significant political contribution, you're so far down on the list, they don't pay attention anyway. Okay, second, when I talked about choosing a, a representative or a senator who has a relevant committee assignment, and third, that you're conducting your meeting with a member and a staffer or the staffer only, parentheses, not the member only. If you think a state representative is busy, just imagine what our federal representatives are doing. And I would just be shocked if any single member of Congress these days answers an email personally, unless it comes from a personal friend. But you want a staffer to be present in that meeting because they're the ones who are going to remember. They're the ones going to do the action item. They're the ones who are going to take it forward. If you're talking to the member only, 99 chances out of 100, it's just, um, what do they call them? Courtesy call. It's a courtesy call. Your constituent, oh, hi, nice to see you, Jane and Joe. Pat on the back, great, thumbs up, keep up the good work. And then you're out the door, and that's it, okay? You want a staffer to be there as well. Okay, now, these members have different kinds of staffers too. If in fact they're on a committee, and like if they're the chair of a committee, they have a whole different set of staffers on that committee. I worked for a committee. I did not work for a single member of Congress, but I worked for a committee. Now that committee had a chairman and a subcommittee chairman, that, and I actually worked for the subcommittee chair, and so people would try to influence him from the personal side. And again, if you're constituents, that's helpful. But the fact is you need to talk to both if you can. And it is your member, if they have a committee assignment, who can get you to a committee staffer. Again, that, and that's the best person to be talking to. It's nice if a member's present, but it's not necessary. But as I said, if you're only talking to the member, the chances are it's a courtesy call. Please vote for me. Remember his uh, action item there? I think he's going to end it with that. OK, next, please. So this is a perspective of either an elected member or their staff. And you need to know they are very pressed for time. They have very busy lives. They have all kinds of people pulling on their sleeves, wanting time. They're meet in meetings continuously. So they have committee meetings, they have uh, caucus meetings, they have this meeting, they have that meeting. Every once in a while they try to see their families, and I, I do mean just try because they don't always achieve it. Um, 
any member of Congress, ha for me, has a lifestyle I would never wish for myself. They don't have control over their schedule or control over their lives. There's a very high divorce rate among members of Congress for a reason, because they miss their graduations, they miss their parents' 50th wedding anniversary, on and on and on. And they do not have control of their schedule. And you just need to know that. And as he said, you know, you may have an appointment at 10 o'clock and at 10.20 you're still waiting going, what the heck, and my next meeting's at 10.30, right? And they don't have control over their own schedule. Don't take it personally. It's just what happens. Okay, they also have to vote. And when you vote in Congress, you must be there in person. Now, why is that? In this day of electronics, they could vote from the moon, right? If they were at the moon, all they need is the internet. But the fact is, they want them to be on the floor to vote because they themselves get lobbied on the way to push their little card in. And there is somebody, they actually have positions called whips, and both parties have them, and they are telling their members as they're walking to the floor how to vote on whatever vote's being taken. There are times when the members do not know what's being voted on. Now, some, <laughs> some shock to some people and not to others, but the fact is some of these are procedural votes and sometimes they're like on the third from the second, da, 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 you know, and everything's written in the negative and nobody can follow it anyway, but there's a whip waiting for them as they walk into the floor that says, you know, and I don't know, Thumbs up, thumbs down, got to talk to you. Trust me, there are little cloak rooms and stuff. That's where the real arm twisting goes on. We really need your vote on this one. You know, don't forget the party needs you to vote this way. That's where it happens. So um, they take voting very seriously. Voting records are kept and they are used in campaigns. And sometimes you'll see, so-and-so was absent X number of percent of the time from votes. And that is used in a campaign. And these members are very uh, aware of that. And not only that, but their own party leadership reminds them of that. And if they're not there for critical vote, they will be hurt. Okay, and it's all how they work together, and they, one scratches one's back, the other one scratches the back, you know, in return, or not. They punish each other. So it just happens. We don't need to like it. It just happens. Okay, another thing from a member's perspective or a staffer's perspective is you are just overwhelmed with information. I can remember sitting down for eight or nine hours a day going from one briefing to the next briefing to the next briefing. Sometimes I had whiplash <laughs> from so much information. And the interesting thing is when I left Capitol Hill, the lack of information was just amazing too. And you didn't have to go to any effort to get it, right? Because people are always wanting to come and talk to you just need to know that's the perspective, that's the, that's the backdrop. You're dropping into this play that's going on, right? And that's what's going on. So you really have to do something special to get their attention. And you also have to know what the rules are. So the state representative told you some of the rules and I'll be going over them, but it's really important to be respectful. Okay, next. They cannot be an expert on every subject, especially a member. And again, they've got all these different committee assignments. I mean, they may be working veterans one day and the next day they're working on, uh, uh, oh, I can't even think, uh, fire retardants or something like that. I mean, it just gets really too ridiculous or sublime. So they're just overwhelmed. And again, they're not an expert on every subject. So they really do rely heavily on their staff. And I know as a committee staffer, my members didn't know a darn thing. We had an MD who was elected to Congress and he was put on the space subcommittee and he didn't know anything. So it was our job to educate him because trust me, everything we didn't tell him, the lobbyists were telling him, right? And you want to get your version in there first <laughs> before his head filled up with other stuff. Okay. And lastly here, they either might care about the issue, they may not, or they might even be opposed to the issue. And on this issue, you can expect, I'm sure, the full spectrum there. Okay, so how can you be heard in an environment like that? He gave you a hint, a one-page summary. And he wasn't kidding, and I'm not kidding. Again, because they are barraged with so much information, you have to boil it down to one page. And don't be putting an eight-point type 
because they can't read, <laughs> even with their glasses on, okay? It has to be very succinct. And don't even use complete sentences. He said bullet points. And that's right, it's you need to have bullet points. And there's so much in our heads and we have so much passion and there's so much emotion going in this, but you have got to boil it down for them. Otherwise, you're not gonna get their attention. So that old joke about hitting the mule between the eye with a two by four, right? You gotta do it because otherwise it's just noise to them. Okay, so what are you gonna put in this one pager? You're gonna talk about what the issue is. That's, you might get away with one sentence here. Not any more than that, okay? What is your issue? Let's say, pick one. We want to end the registry, okay? You can just pick that as an issue. Okay. Uh, then you have to give background information. Say, oh my gosh, Adam Walshack, Sorna, oh da 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 da. That's where you can go into a little bit of detail and bullet points, okay? But you're only going to get that much. Okay. Then what's the current status? And so, absolutely, I can't you know, wait to talk to California legislators about what they decided in Ohio, the Su Ohio Supreme Court, and say, look, we're at least as smart as Ohio. Come on, it's time to catch up. Okay, he also talked about the ask. So when you go in there, you ask, and you put this in writing, what specific thing do you want him or her to do? So it's oppose bill such and such, support bill such and such, or we've got draft legislation, we're looking for a sponsor, or it's been introduced by so-and-so and now we need co-sponsors. So it's that precise, because if you just ask them to do the right thing, oh my God, you don't know what's going to happen and you don't want to leave it to their imagination. So you have to tell them very succinctly again what it is you need. And he was absolutely right you put your um, contact information on that sheet of paper because they may lose everything else. And I would go in there, I did this for, for 12 years with this organization. Every year we went to Washington, D.C., a whole herd of people from California, and we went and knocked on all the doors. And by the way, California has the largest congressional delegation. We have 53 members. Um, I think Alabama has seven, so by comparison. So we did a lot of door knocking. And we would take these beautiful folders with two pockets on them and all kinds of information. But I knew what was gonna to happen to most of that. I'd even take out a piece of paper, like the point paper, and I'd say, if you keep nothing else, keep this. Okay, just help them along. Oh, by the way, we're having a reception here too. But if you keep nothing else, we're at keep this piece of paper. And on that information, on that page, needed to be all your contact information. How are they gonna contact you? address, phone number, email address, of course, these days is most important. Put somebody's name on there, for goodness sake, because if they do get around to calling, or much more likely the staffer calls, they want to ask her somebody. Nobody likes to call a number and, and not know who, who they're going to talk to. So anyway, those are some very strong suggestions. Now, it is okay to bring backup information, all right? The, well, the representative said, I don't read books, so don't bother preparing a book and do not bother copying it and going to all that expense. They're not going to read it. So instead, bring five pages, you know, if they ask you a question about the registry and you could have a five pager, perhaps nothing more than five pages and say here, or you've got a story about someone whose life has been destroyed by the registry, okay, give that to them. That's additional information but only really if they ask for it, or at least if they express a desire. They seem to be really interested, because you'll go into meetings and you're pouring your heart out there, and the person's checking his watch, he's looking at his Blackberry. I know the state representative said he can multitask, and many people can, but not everybody can. You know you have their attention when you see their eyeballs, just like me talking here to you right now. If you can see people's eyes, you know that they're talking. They know, you know that they're receiving the information that you're sending them. And if they write something down, hot dog, that's a good meeting. <laughs> so, and by the way, I, I disagree with the, with the state representative very respectfully. I like to hand them the point paper. I want them to read along as we're doing this. And then sometimes I'll write notes right on, on that piece of paper. Because if they're writing on a piece of scrap paper or even their little notebooks, gosh, only knows what will happen after that. 
So anyway, um, bring your uh, backup information. And also afterwards to send a thank you note I mean, how he, he said it so eloquently that he keeps each and every handwritten thank you note that he's been given because they get so few. And actually, they don't give that many uh, emails that say thank you. Most of the time, they're getting hit over the head by somebody who is upset with an issue, right? And they very rarely hear from somebody who's happy. And I have gone in the next year and somebody go, oh, yes, well, thank you for that great thank you note that you sent them. I mean, duh, it, you know, it takes some time. You get, might get some writer's cramps, especially with 53 members. But on the other hand, it really is, is worth it. OK, next, please. OK, this is more about how to be heard. Um, make it personal, not to you, to them, OK? They may not care, especially if you're not a constituent. They don't care. Remember, he said, if you're not a constituent, he's listening, but it's for information. He knows you can't help or hurt him. OK. so. Research the background of your elected official. There's tons of information on the internet today, and some of it is even true. Especially, <laughs> look at things like committee assignments and what is on their website, you know, because they like to brag about themselves, right? And they like to brag, I did this and I did that. And if you notice, like 70% of their newsletter is about, or their website's about education, you need to go in there with that perspective. And I'll tell you one time, and I'll even mention this congresswoman by name, Maxine Waters, and uh, she represents uh, a, a district down uh, in the LA area, and there are about 20 districts just in LA. So she's in LA, and uh, we went in, to, and we had an appointment to, with a meeting with a staffer and everything, and we get there, and, uh, and the question was, hmm, uh, yeah, okay, well, that person's not available. Uh, we'll find, we'll get somebody else for you. So we did, we're standing there, and these people, I mean, I'm leading a group of these people who've traveled all the way across country from California to Washington, D.C., and they're so excited to be in the nation's capital, and we're basically told to stand at the reception desk while they go find somebody. So they did. And, they, and this person, I can't remember, male or female, stood there and basically was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it wasn't until we said, X number of people of your constituents are actually aerospace employees that they said, oh, you know, I think we could have a meeting room. And we were, you know, we were invited to go sit down at a table and talk to the staffer. So it really is important to talk, okay, that was a constituent thing, but an issue. So if they really care about education, talk to them about education. You, I mean, RSO issues are very broad, and you can talk to them about education. It's important we educate our children so they don't take pictures of their private parts and send them to their friends, right? I mean, that would do it right there. So anyway, you've got to know what they care about. All right. Then the other thing is, and, and the state rep representative talked about that. He talked about having a uniform message. And the uniform message is really important because if you hear too many voices on the same issue, it just turns into noise. And that's exactly how it sounds to them. So he talked about, as I recall, somebody said something to him, and then somebody, the same somebody said something different to a different member. It's really not a good idea. You have to speak with one voice. That's why you prepare your point paper before you ever go to the meeting. You sit down with your people on your team, if at all possible, and get them focused on that issue so they're aware, too, what's on the point paper, OK? Because you want to speak with one voice. And if everybody agrees that the registry should be abolished by the year Humpty Frump, and then you go, hey, and guess what? The ACLU agrees with us, and SOSAN agrees with us, and all these other organizations agree with us, those, that, will that will increase their interest, and get, you will get more attention in that way. Okay. Um, also, if you want to um, talk about other nations and what they may be doing, that even helps for the more senior members. The way freshman members of Congress, they're just trying to survive. It, as he said, um, there's a really high learning curve. I mean, it's almost vertical. And so for the members of Congress as well, they want to, um, uh, they don't have time to think about statesmanship. They're just trying to talk, think about how do I get reelected in two years? It's a very unfortunate situation. 
Okay, and then if you do have somebody who's already agreeing with your position, you know, again, knowing what committees they're on and such, if their committee chair woman or man is already in agreement with your issue, you state that. You better, and you need to be accurate about that, by the way. <laughs> but you can say that we already have so and so signature on this letter. Um, you know, so and so has agreed to co-sponsor a bill. Uh, they've sent out a dear colleague letter or whatever. That's really important to them. That knows that some other of their colleagues are indeed supporting your issue. Okay, next please. So here are some of the basic rules. One is make an appointment. And he talked about that. It's not 100% guarantee you're going to still have the meeting, but it sure increases your chances. You'll have a meeting with someone because if you can say, hey, I was scheduled to meet with so-and-so at this time, then that is, makes it much more likely. They will try to find someone. But you really do want to talk to the right staffer because the staffers do have separate duties. So there are going to be people who care, you know, care, about, uh, care about certain issues, whether, again, veterans or fire retardant or whatever. And it really increases your effectiveness if, in fact, you're meeting with the right person. You can find that out ahead of time. And one of the things that we always had on our website was in fact the list of all the members and who their staffers were on two very important um, issues. One was aerospace and the other was education because we cared about those two issues. And we put that on our website. So if our members wanted to contact somebody, they knew to call up the office and ask for Valerie, right? They didn't say, well, now who does that? But also when it came time to set up appointments for meetings, again, that's who we would go to. Okay, so uh, be on time and don't be early. And that might be a head scratcher. I'm one of those people that's compulsively early to meetings. And I just have to sometimes pace the hall out before I go in the meeting because the office space is extremely limited. In Congress, they never expected people to have as many staffers as they do. Um, some people think that they have far too many staffers. And it's an argument. They, I mean, they're dealing with such complex issues right now. You need to have subject matter experts. But the fact is, if you show up too early, there's no place for you and you're gonna be in this little gaggle standing at the reception desk and people are trying to walk around you and this, that, and the other. So give yourself about five minutes ahead of time and that's it. And the other thing is make sure everybody from your group is there on time because if it's not in a lot of offices, they won't let you start the meeting until everybody in your group is there. And there's good reason for that. Okay, um, and your meeting, <laughs> where you actually have your meeting, I've talked about the reception desk standing up. Oh, it could be worse. You can be out in the hallway. And again, that's because, um, in fact, space is a premium, at a premium. And the best thing is, you'll know you have your best meeting when they actually let you go into the member's office, with or without the member being there. So there's a lot of room to spread out. You've got comfortable places to sit. But even hallway meetings can, in fact, be meaningful. Don't be turned off by where you're doing it. Sometimes you go down to the snack bar or whatever. The fact is that they don't have a whole lot of options office space. That's just it. Okay, next, to be courteous, um, to be polite, and even when they disagree or they're just totally unreasonable. And uh, I'm not saying you have to have a smile on your face all the time, and if you need to get out in the hallway and call them a jerk, go ahead. Just make sure the door's already closed before you do that, I my suggestion. Because you heard straight from the horse's mouth there, if you upset the member, they're going to remember, and they're going to remember your issue. And even if they might otherwise agree, they're going to say, these people are jerks. Even though it's a good issue, I'm not going to agree with them on anything. OK, next, please. So my next suggestion here is bring a friend. So in other words, don't go in alone unless you've got a lot of experience under your belt. So trust me, after 20 years, I could go in alone, not a problem. But somebody needs to take notes during the meeting. And you want to maintain that eye-to-eye -eye contact with a staffer, and it's really hard to do when you're writing notes, right? And so what I would do is I'd always choose the eye-to-eye -eye contact, and then sometimes I'd forget by the time I got to the hallway. But uh, so anyway, take a friend if you can, somebody who's knowledgeable is always good. Um, I can't think of anybody who would be obnoxious uh, to bring a friend, unless if you know that this person is very vocal, I guess, from a different party and is well known in the district or something like that. Okay, and then it's also uh, very um, important to follow up on any requests that they might make. And it happens during a meeting. I would go in there and they go, well, 
I, what's the statistics on this one? Oh, guess what, recidivism, right? And you want, to, you want to educate the member and the staff about recidivism and say, you know, these recidivism rates in most states are just totally bogus. Every time, you know, an RSO gets picked up for, for a speeding ticket, all, all of a sudden, you know, it's called recidivism and it's ridiculous. So anyway, whatever it is, you want to say, yes, of course, I'll get that to you as quickly as I can. Now, they may have a specific reason for that. They may have a hearing that's coming up and they need that factor figure for their hearing. Or if you're talking to a staff or only with the member and the member's not there, the staffer wants to bring it to the member's attention and knows that it'll be a more compelling argument if in fact they have those facts and figures. All right, your business card is really important. Usually these days you can't get in the door without a request from the receptionist for your business card. So if you're doing this, my strong suggestion is get a business card. So that means for a state organizations, we need to develop a business card, right? And even if it says name and volunteer, that's fine, or it can just say a name. You don't have to have a lofty title. But again, you'd put the name of the organization, the contact information for the organization, not your personal information, all right? You really don't want to do that unless somebody, except in extreme circumstances, and I won't even talk about it. Okay, so again, uh, request their business card. And usually most staffers and members are trained, actually a member rarely will hand you a, his business card or her business card, usually it'll staffer who gives it to you. But you want to have that in your possession, again, for your can I use the word Rolodex, uh, if that's not too dated, or you, know, you, you scan it these days and you've got the information collected. You want that information. A member's email, by the way, it's never their personal email, just to let you know. And so it'll, but it'll have an email address on there and somebody will be reading it. And again, maybe with the ex exception of that state representative who was here, I just don't know of anybody in Congress who actually reads their emails the first time. I think staffers screen them and then they send them to their boss if they think they're interesting. Okay, so uh, at the end to thank the member and or the staffer for the meeting, uh, polite, uh, being polite goes a long way. If you can remember again the hustle and bustle that they're used to dealing with, people coming, people going all the time, and people just uh, sometimes forget, you know, those very basic rules. Okay, this is the next and the next to last slide, which is resources. Um, there's something called the Congressional Yellow Book, and it's yellow, and it's big and thick, and I didn't bring one with me from California because it's too thick and big. But anyway, not only does it list all the elected officials, has their addresses and phone numbers for their D.C. office, but also their district offices, it lists the staffers and the issues to which the staffers are assigned. And that's really important information. Even though it's there, my suggestion is when you call up the first time, ask, is so-and-so still in the office and are they still assigned to this, to this issue? Because there's, there is a lot of turnover. And um, a lot of people aren't aware, but even for con congressional staffers, if they're in a personal office, they get paid very little money. I mean, these people quite often have a law degree, and I don't know what it is now, but they used to work, work like twenty-five or $30,000 a year, and I don't even know how they paid off their student loans in, in those situations. But anyway, and so um, what happens is the staffers, of course, want to go from a personal committee and go on to a, a committee staff. I was... Uh, uh, in the uh, executive branch first, I worked for NASA, I worked for um, the Air Force, always doing space type things, and I was got pretty high up on the pay scale there, and my biggest concern, I wanted to go work for Congress, but my biggest concern was the pay cut I would be taking, and the fact is I found out going to committee staff, I, I didn't get a pay cut at all, I got a raise. So, but for most of the people in these member offices, they're paid very small amounts of money. Most of the people are there because they really are passionate, or they're, you know, very ambitious and they're working their way up. And some of them indeed want to be members of Congress themselves someday. Okay, so uh, the Congressional Yellow Book, it's expensive to buy it. Some libraries, certainly big cities, have it, and you can do it that way. But um, otherwise, it's for people who do professional lobbying and pay, I think it's about $1,000 a year. 
So it's out of the reach of most of us probably. So anyway, um, a lot of information though is available online. You can type in the member's uh, name these days and you will get a lot of information. As I said, most of it's true, but don't believe all of it. Um, and then this uh, online source that I have here, thomas.gov, actually is a website that you can get copies of all bills. Any bill that's been introduced, you can get off of Thomas. And all you need to know is either a bill number, or if you know some keywords, you type it in, hit search, and, uh, and you'll get it. And not only do you get the bill language, it'll tell you the status of the bill. So when it's been considered by committee, whether or not it's been marked up, whether or not it's been passed by a committee or anybody else, you know, where is it? And oh, by the way, remember, when it gets passed by one House of Congress, it has to be kept passed by the other House of Congress. And if they're not identical bills, then they have to go to something called a conference. And the conference, the House and the Senate staffers, not the members usually, are basically duking it out, saying, I gotta have this, what do you have to have? And there's some horse trading that goes on. So that's how that works. So next, please, is my request for questions. And I don't know if anybody has any in writing, or if you just have one, raise your hand, and I'd be happy to answer to my best of my abilities. There's one. Yes, ma'am. If the well, staff. Sorry, uh, well, ask your question, I'm but sorry. then after okay, uh, if you have I'm questions, sorry. send them to me and I will. Okay, Ellen would prefer to have them in writing if you I'm would. Sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> if the staffers do all the duking out, then, what do you, then why would you want to even have, even have a meeting with them? In other words, if they have all the information, which is what I think you're saying, then what's the point of going to see Joe Schmo Senator? because they're the ones that can turn things upside down. They're the ones that have the real power. And I'll just tell you, for example, um, and again, I'm on committee staff. We had a hearing a markup the next morning. Markup means you're considering a draft bill and making changes to it, right? We were all prepared. I was with the chairman of the committee until about 10 o'clock at night. Everything was, every I was dotted, every T was crossed. We wrapped it up with a bow. Got to the hearing the next morning, and the chairman reversed himself in the, in the markup. And I was just flabbergasted, um, not to mention angry. And um, what I found out after the fact was a member, another member of Congress, had approached him and said, hey, I need a favor. And so this committee chairman said, OK, and he reversed himself on a really, to me, an important issue. So they do have the power. Until people get questions, yes. I have one myself. Please. Um, what do you think is the best argument that we can give a legislator to convince him in our issue? Sure. Um, thank you for that question, actually. Um, let's see. For the, those who attended my workshop, I'll just tell you, I have a daughter who's gay, and I believe that the gay rights movement um, has a way uh, that if we f were to follow something similar to what they're doing um, would be a winning uh, approach. And that is to say, I am, uh, you know, um, I have a family member who is, I have a friend who is, or whatever, you know, a registered person. And this person is productive and had a great life until this thing happened. And it's really um, letting them know that just because somebody's on a registry does not mean they are a monster. You know, there are a few out there, unfortunately, and that's where everybody's mind goes to. And you have to say, no, this person did one thing wrong, they've paid for that thing that they did wrong, usually going to prison, right? And now they want to re-enter society and be a productive human being, but they're being blocked from that. And it's a, per, it's a thing about making it personal and letting, I think, members of Congress and others know that, that these are people too. The other one, and that approach, so I think that approach will resonate with a lot of people. And the other one, I think, to lawyers and people who think that way, and, and you're talking a lot of political science majors on, on Capitol Hill, is look, there are people in this country who are being denied their basic civil rights you know, ex post facto and every other darn thing that's going on here. And it's like, as a country, do we want to be known for this? Because we will, as a country, be known for this. 
You know, you think about Japanese internment camps and other mistakes that we've made as a society. This is another mistake that's been made, and it's basically time to clean up the mess. Another question here. How different is it to see a representative in Washington versus at his home office? Usually, if you're in the home office, it's actually more relaxed, a little more casual. Um, the, the problem is the staffer that might be with the, with the member may not be uh, the right person or have the right um, amount of power even within the office. Yeah. Question here from someone, I believe, in California. Um, being in California, can you tell us more about San Francisco's attempt to make offenders a protected class? Okay. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe that specific legislation, but I know, um, uh, and is he assembly or Senate, but uh, uh, his first last name is Leno. And so he basically introduced legislation this past session um, to have the tier system work in California. We don't have it. Everybody who's on the registry is on the registry for life. So, I mean, how backward is that? And California is known to some people, many of us actually as being progressive, but for some reason, they took the wrong, you know, the wrong road here. So, uh, so anyway, I, I know that. I don't know that specific term about being protected, but, um, we, but on the same hand, we've got George and Sharon Runner, one in state assembly and one in state senate, who are passing more restrictive legislation all the time. In Orange County, um, in you know, Southern California, uh, the, that county uh, just in the last three months passed legislation that prohibits any registered person from going to a public beach or a public park. Yeah. And other, and then, other, so now that was the county, and now other cities in the county are doing similar things and also reducing residency requirements to, you know, uh, really, um, you know, making it more and more difficult for people to be anywhere in their city. Oh, wow, what a coincidence. I actually, pardon me, have been told that it is now impossible for any registered person to live in the city of San Francisco. You must have caught the senator at a good time, and I will tell you, the senators are not as busy as the House members, believe it or not, and especially if you come from a smaller state. California is a different story since our state is so big, but for, um, like Alaska, this is kind of a funny thing. They have two senators, and they only have one member of the House, so think about it. The, the member of the House represents the whole state, and the Senate, they have to split it up. Did you have a question or a comment, sir? question for, for someone who has no experience at all in uh, lobbying how long does it take you think to get comfortable of course it varies from one person to another but do you think it's a very steep learning curve and to get really at ease with it how long does it take I would say it, it depends because you have a lot of preparation before you go into the meeting. So if you have somebody who's knowledgeable about the process and who can, you know, do the research about is this person on the right committee or not, and then um, what issues do they really care about or not, and then oh, what staffer are you meeting with and the like, um, and writing the point paper. So that requires, I think, more time, quite frankly. And then the other is, I think that it can take very little time to go into a member's office, just like you did, right? You went to your U.S. Senator's office and such, and, and you got a warm welcome, and I'm happy to hear that. It doesn't always happen, and sometimes you're not there. Um, but, the, but anyway, um, and the best thing, I think, is even if you're going into an office, to have a more experienced person with you who can lead the meeting and would have you participate, but knows kind of the structure. It's a little bit of a kabuki dance, um, because you want to draw the other person out you don't want to just 
be rapid fire, fact, 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 and this is what we want. You want to draw them in and kind of say, well, this is something, are you interested in that? <laughs> or do you think the member would uh, support this? And then draw it out from them. So, you know, that's a successful meeting. When you're just in the transmit mode and you get nothing back, that is not a successful meeting. You might feel good when you leave, but if you think about it, it's really not a successful meeting. Another question. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'll ask mine after. <laughs> oh, it's long, huh? <laughs> uh, our lobbying effort here in Missouri uh, was successful in this session here um, with dealing with our state representatives. And I'm not going to use the word easy, but we were successful and it was really, um, and we did a good job with that. So, and basically our representative is our first line of your political voice in the state. Now, I've tested the waters on our federal legislators, our congressmen, and I have found that they're a little bit more distant than your actual representative. And I've sent letters to them, and some never sent them back, and I've tried to get in touch with my, my congressman in my district, mm -hmm. and they ignore you. And so it is easier doing, I hate using that word easier, but it's a little bit easier doing this on a state level. How can we really um, get into that federal end of it? They're so far away, they're in Washington. Um, and as I say, we've sent out letters and it's not as simple as it is doing your own state on your state level. Uh, how, how do you get through that, that wall into your federal? Oh, well, I agree with you and, and one thing, I think it will help to everybody to understand that you think about it, and um, I'm not much of a sports fan, but I'll just try to use a baseball analogy. So, you know, in the baseball, when they have the farm teams, right, the farm teams, the people are out there and, and they're hoping to make it into the major league. Well, you actually have farm teams in politics, too. So look around. Who's on your county board of supervisors? Who are your mayors? Who are your, uh, and who are, you know, your state, the two state houses, too? Those are the people who probably are going to make it to Congress. I mean, you don't usually get somebody who goes to Congress who doesn't have a lot of political experience because they just can't attract the necessary resources to get there. So spending time at those levels can, in fact, pay off later. Now, you don't want to ignore the people who are there now, obviously, and such. But the other thing is, again, look at the issues that they care about and start talking. Even, you know, I would start with the district office because they're in the state where you are. And it's a lot closer than going to Washington. DC. So start talking to the staffers and, and, and again, make it, uh, make it relevant to their district. I also think having public meetings is a good idea. So they have things called town halls and that you can have a town hall. You can invite them to your town hall you know, after, if, if they'd be brave enough to come. And, and just let them know, too, that there are other constituents who care about this issue and who have a different point of view, you know, as far as about even how best to protect the kids. It's not to have these registries out there because, and, you know, I'm not good at statistics, but I know it's a low percentage of, of children who are, who are attacked are, in, you know, somebody who's a stranger. I mean, that's what's supposed to tell people, but these are people who are already in the home, you know, whether it's a family member or it's a friend, family friend or something like that, that's who usually is the offender. Another question, what federal legislation on this topic, sex offenders, do you see on the horizon in the next two or three years? at the federal level. Well, I'm such an optimist, so um, let's put one on there to abolish the whole registry, shall we? <laughs> yeah. And um, I have this great book, and I'm just blanking on, it's called the Sex Offender Laws or something like that, and when they were talking about the Adam Walsh Act, there was actually a member of Congress who, like, who spoke out against it. And uh, those are the kinds of people that we need to look for, and we need to support them. We really do, because they're sticking their necks out. And I'll tell you, this: uh, the state legislator from California, Leno is his last name, he can get away with what he does because he's from San Francisco, and so many other people in the state, they just say, oh, he's from San Francisco. 
Francisco. They always do strange things. So, and he's going to get reelected by his constituents because they're willing to stick their necks out too. But what we need to do is we need to find those people and we need to help support them and ask them because sometimes they need they need street soldiers. They need people on the ground that we can do things, you know, or, or maybe set up a meeting. They want to talk to somebody else and we can find a constituent in another member's district and because of that we can, you know, actually get them to sit down and talk to each other. They don't always talk to each other, believe it or not. And, and I'll tell you how bad it is in, in Congress. This is just the California delegation, right? 50, well, 51 members of the House. The Republicans and the Democrats from California will not sit in the same room together and have a meal. It's been that way for years. And my former executive director was a former Republican member of Congress. And she was denied access to go speak to the Democrats in, in their weekly luncheon. They wouldn't even let her in, even though she was a former member. Because she was a former Republican member, they would not let her in the room. So I went. I just happen to be a Democrat, but, um, but I've never been a member of Congress. But it's just those kinds of things. And you don't know, and I hope not all states are that way. Like I said, Alabama, I think, has seven members. I hope the Republicans and the Democrats can actually sit down in the same room and have a meal together. And uh, the only time with the Californians that did, every time like there's a new governor, they'll sit down and have one meal together to welcome the new governor. Yeah. Something that I, and I know others in RSOL, would like to have your opinion on. Mm -hmm. Um, there were discussions, I think last year and even before that, about creating a special lobbying uh, group specifically in Washington, D.C. for RSOL. But then there are a lot of people within RSOL who feel that it really happens at the state level and given how limited our resources are, you know, with our organization that we should really focus at the state level and that we shouldn't really, uh, at this point, concentrate at lobbying the federal level. What do you think about that? It would be a mistake. Really? Think about the Adam Walsh Act. That was federal legislation, folks. The federal government can really mess up our lives. So it can't be ignored. Where the balance is, I guess, remains to be seen. I know uh, the organization War Women Against Registry is going to be making a presentation tomorrow, and I believe they're going to. One of their focuses will be on uh, le uh, lobbying at the federal level, and the other way to do it is through collaboration. So ACLU, I'm so happy to see that they're on the agenda later today, and so ACLU has Washington D.C. lobbyists. Um, I'm working locally with a group of uh, defense trial lawyers. Actually, it's the California organization of defense trial lawyers. I imagine they have a national organization as well. I haven't gotten to them. But these folks are already doing that. And and my hope and, and my I believe it is possible for this organization to have a federal presence as well. It's great to have a Washington DC lobbyist, but it can even just be one person. And then what happens, just like I did, and I was in California at the time, march people, you know, to DC or actually we just met there quite frankly. But you have one person that who organizes all these meetings and such, and it can happen with even with limited resources. Yeah. Yeah. You actually, you have a question just quickly. Um, you answered the question quickly, but how many people do you think it would require to have a, a good, efficient presence uh, in DC? Okay. Well, as I said, a minimum of one. I'd say yeah, on, the okay. on the ground, <laughs> we have and that. then other people to support him or her. And, uh, and there are also lobbyists for hire, and you can even start with one part-time and, uh, and work from there. Absolutely. Do you think by our working diligently in each state and, cre and creating change within the state, make us more effective in Washington when we can come as a state and say, look at what we have going on in all of the states individually, even if there's just a couple of states, like we're having, you know, some states right now are making progress. The more states that are making progress, I mean, who, who are our legislators creating these laws for, if not, the, if not us? And we need to make change locally, I think, to affect Washington changes not just going up to Washington and expecting them to solve our problem. I don't think they will. And please understand, I think both are required. And, and, and it's even more than that. I, I wish it could be that simple. It's not just legislation. It's also litigation. 
and it's public relations or the public. And so remember Amy's uh, pyramid that she put together? I thought that was very well done. We need to get out there on every wavelength and communicate with people and educate them. But I think what happens in the states are, it is in fact very important. And so um, I actually I just got a thought um, while you were speaking, which is if we could get a congressional caucus created on RSO issues. They have caucuses that don't have the authority to have hearings and things like that, but sometimes that helps to have an informal caucus so you have a nucleus of members of Congress who care about an issue. I mean, there's over 400 of little darlings on the House side, right? We just got 100 on the Senate side. But it, and it's kind of like, you know, elbows out and somebody at a, uh, a Feline's basement sale or something like that. I mean, it's that noisy and that raucous sometimes. So you need to have something to get people's attention. And so ha having a caucus or whatever, but, but what you can do is like, okay, we've got Ohio that is coming to its senses, at least as ex post facto, right? And then, you know, you get a number of states, and it doesn't even have to be a large number, two or three, and you can get start getting the congressional members from those states to start talking about it and say, hey, federal government, what are we doing? How come we did this stupid thing? And oh, by the way, it does say in the US Constitution, no ex post facto laws. And oh, by the way, even though it's the Supreme Court at one time said this is not punishment, it really looks like a whole lot of people are being punished. So let's take a second look at that. I have another question here. Uh, one of our members um, contacted the, her Congress uh, woman and senator via letters mm -hmm. and she got a response from both of them saying that this is not their issue and that they should really get in touch with their local state senator. Uh, how does one respond to such a response? Sue every single state for doing this. Yeah. And you know what, I believe it or not, I'm a lawyer who doesn't like to file lawsuits. I'd much rather get along. I'd much rather come reach a compromise. I'd much rather do things outside of court. But sometimes you just have to do it to get their attention. <laughs> anyway, we can certainly talk about that another time too. And, and uh, you know, it, the strategy about who does it and when it happens and, and all that. And that could be something that happens at a state level, quite frankly. I mean, I know, for example, on the California State Registry, there's all kinds of mistakes made there. And I know the most about Frank, so let me bring Frank up one more time. And he doesn't mind um, because he's really outed himself on this. And, and when it mentions his offense, um, it doesn't mention what year it happened. Right? And so somebody looking at that, I go, oh, wow, that's a dangerous person. Well, my goodness, this happened more than 30 years ago, right? And, you know, no, and then there's no little notes like he was intoxicated at the time, he was a flaming alcoholic at the time, and he's been sober for this many years. I mean, what if, what if the, even that additional information could be put on the registry? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, instead of one time somebody did something they shouldn't have done. Mm. whether it's personal or not, but to disclose that so people aren't so quick to judge. Yes, I agree. Yes? Let me ask, ask this as far as the legislative, uh, or the legal issue goes. Okay. Um, on two occasions, I have been, had incorrect information listed about me from the registry. One time, my registry listing, because of a flaw on the state, had me listed as being convicted of forcible rape with a weapon. Another time I was listed as living in Iowa. Should we consider suing the state when they make mistakes? Um, when you, you have to exhaust your administrative remedies first um, in a case like that, but certainly going to your state attorney general, because they're the ones responsible for the websites, and say, you've made a mistake. And now I need you to correct it. And you can even get them a deadline, just for um, giggles. Um, yeah, you can do that. And then when they don't meet the deadline, then you sue them because you've exhausted your administrative remedies. Yes. There's one way back there. That that reminds me of one one issue. Um, 
I, I do travel quite a bit, and I realize I'm on the registries in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida, um, possibly also Massachusetts. I'm not positive. And I, well, I, know. I said last year at this conference, my goal was to be on the registry in every state. <laughs> um, but on the, I mean, you know, as I think about it, technically, am I not in compliance with the states that I'm not currently living in because um, I don't register every every quarter in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, whatever. I mean, am I counted on those registries? I don't know the answer to that question. There's probably greater experts in this room than than me. But why don't we save that for uh, when the session's over? I, I'd be happy to investigate it with you. I don't know the answer. Brenda? Yeah. Um, I wanted to make more of a comment, um, actually, to address the, um, the that state question versus the national question. Uh, I ran that by a paralegal. Um, what often happens with uh, when when we go and, and contact somebody from uh, from the national about what happens is we're talking about our state law. Uh, for instance, in Maryland, you know, we passed the Adam Walsh Act last year, yay. Um, and everybody started contacting their national representative about changing the law back. But that was a state law that went into effect. So the, the catch is to know which law is, is you know, where, when it's a federal issue and when it's a state issue. Um, you know, you do want to talk to them about the Adam Walsh Act. You want to talk to them about SORNA. But if your state passed the Adam Walsh Act, you need to talk to your state about fixing the Adam Walsh Act. That's just a real quick comment on that. Sorry. No, that's absolutely okay. right. All right. And so um, I guess the easiest thing, again, if it's your state legislature passing the law that or has uh, introduced legislation, that's who you need to talk to. And if it's the feds, then the same. Um, but I think one of the great services that RSOL um, serves, of course, is providing information on the website when our federal or state governments go stupid, my term, and uh, start, you know, doing these these things or threatening to do these things. And then the question is, you know, how can you address it and how can you do it quickly? I mean, the problem when you have a city or a city ordinance or a county ordinance or something, they can pass them relatively quickly. And so I know when what was going on down in Orange County in Southern California, it happened really fast. And in that case, we had an RSO who was brave enough, a young man in his 40s who stood up there and said, I'm an RSO, and do you understand what you're doing to my life and to uh, so many other people as well? He was a very brave, he is a very brave young man. So um, we need more brave people and family members too to get up there and to speak. And uh, that's what certainly state organizations are about too, to help to get that information and then to, to disseminate it as quickly as possible so we can address it. He wasn't able to stop the legislation from passing, but he actually uh, was able to, uh, to identify two out of four supervisors who were, in fact, sympathetic to the cause. So this will be uh, the last question. Okay, Donna. Um, which actually brought up the thought I had in my head. Um, you mentioned an information sheet, brief, bullet points. So you're at the federal level and you're lobbying, let's hope. Where does the personal story fit in, if at all? Do you have time for that? Should you do it, or do you just yes. stick to the facts? Personal stories are great as long as you can keep them short. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, my daughter, who's gay, also happens to be brilliant. And so um, it's not just mom talking here, but uh, she convinced herself at an early age she wanted to be, bless you, going to aerospace. She wanted to go to MIT, and she went to MIT, right? And um, so when we talked about education and seeing, and this big project that I was working toward, which Oh, well. um, you know, it was, it was education related, and I said, I literally saw the light bulb go off, <laughs> bless you, in her head when she was five years old. She met an astronaut, and when she turned, and when she met that astronaut, the astronaut, she was convinced, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be an astronaut. Well, she's not an astronaut today, but she is an aerospace engineer, and the fact is that just meeting that astronaut gave her that impetus um, to become an aerospace engineer. So if you can say something that short, <laughs> 
Yes, but and my friend Frank again and Plummer, um, that man cannot tell a short story. I would never allow him to tell his story in any meeting with any elected representative because it's going to be at least 30 minutes and nobody has that much time. So as long as you can distill it down to 60 seconds or less, I'd say yes. And again, statistics can speak loudly too. You don't even necessarily have to talk about one person's story, but I don't know how many people in California know. We have 45,000, more than 45 thousand registered people in California 11 more than 11,000 people just in Los Angeles County and so I mean I was shocked when I heard those facts and then you think about that and okay and every family is four you multiply that by four and then they have friends and colleagues and and such and it's just you know when you start sometimes you don't have to tell a story you can just tell the numbers and that in itself tells the story a good hand of applause for Janice